So thank you all very much for joining us here today. Uh, we really appreciate your support, but we know from the feedback we've had from other events that they go down extremely well. And I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Martin Skur, who, as I say, uh, is a columnist with the Mail. He's a member of the My Death, My Decision medical group, but what many of you wouldn't have known probably until you saw the publicity for this event is that he's what I might call the medical brain behind the successful TV series, Doc Martin, which I did have to confess, I watched a couple of episodes during lockdown and it felt like a sort of warm blanket taking you away from the harsh reality and dystopia in which we've been living to um, a rather comfortable uh, town uh, on the coast there. I thought it would be really interesting for you because I've, I've had conversations with Martin um, about his background, but um, it'd be interesting for you to hear what his medical background is because it's quite astonishing over the years. I think it runs to over 40 years um, and it's been extremely varied. Um, we will come on to then ask him about how he came to be involved in Doc Martin and obviously later on about um, his um, support for the assisted dying campaign. But Martin, maybe you could just begin by uh, telling people the, the chronology of your uh, career and I might interject from time to time with some uh, questions on a bit more detail. I, um, I was very fortunate to be trained at Westminster Hospital, which then was in Horse Ferry Road, quite close to Lambeth Bridge by the House of Commons. And um, I had gone to University College in Gower Street initially to do basic medical science, but my clinical medicine was at Westminster Hospital and it was a baptism of fire, 1973. We had a three day week, power cuts, and a lot of bombing by the IRA around the area. And I was initially a house physician, six months uh, in a post in medicine as opposed to surgery. Um, and there was one particular event, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment. But uh, after six months as a house physician on what was called a one in two rotor, that was the famous 102 hour week. I then became a house surgeon after six months and worked for Professor Harold Ellis, who was my boss. And that was really the probably the the most challenging, but the most memorable part of my early career, because Professor Ellis said, well, there's only one professor of surgery. I only need one house surgeon working for me. So he was full time and so was I. So I then had the 168 hour week and lived in and did everything. But the, 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 the feature I was going to give you from my first six months as a house physician was the first week I admitted a man who'd had a fit. So bear in mind, up to this moment, I've been a medical student being trained, looked after, lectured at, examined, now I was the man with the bleep looking after a male ward and a female ward and the man on call two nights a week for anything that came through casualty. So in came a young man, 23 years old, the same age as I was, having had a fit, unconscious, and the diagnosis was that he had mumps and this was mumps encephalitis, the virus had got into his brain. And we nursed him on what was called the respiratory unit. This was the beginnings of intensive care. So the respiratory unit subsequently became the intensive care unit, the ICU in that hospital. And you were there because the anaesthetist looked after you on a ventilator. And, and my firm, my team, of which I was the most junior and probably the most irrelevant, we looked after this young man who died after two days. So on the Friday of that week, there I was in the coroner's court in Horsbury Road, the coroner being Dr. Gavin Thurston in that era having to present the case. And of course, I couldn't help but feel guilty because you turn up to present the story and you, you've got to explain why the man didn't survive. But not only that, he had mumps and I'd never had mumps. And this was before the MMR vaccine, before mumps vax, I'd never had it as a child because it wasn't far from my mind that I might myself catch mumps from him. But anyway, no further thought on that. Managed to survive that week, survived the grilling from the coroner, but it was a, I suppose I'm telling you this story because it shows that life's tough when you first graduate and you've had an easy ride up till then. Because as so many people have reminded me and as I teach those who I teach, doing medicine is only like doing 48 GCSEs all at once. None of it's very difficult, but there's an awful lot of it. Well, my second six months with Professor Ellis, 
the story. Martin, could I just could I just ask you? So you just explained about how this young man died, and at such a young age for you, I, I imagine in your medical training you must have been uh, trained about how you cope with death and people dying. But when it's the first case where you've actually been fully, I mean, in inverted commas, responsible, obviously, if he had a particular illness from which he was going to die, that was going to be the case. But how did you respond in relation to the, the death of that person at the time? Can you remember whether it had a big impact on you? It had a big impact on me. But as a student, three years clinical medicine in the hospital, you had seen a lot of death, although you were very peripheral to that in that you were almost like a you were an audience and there wasn't a lot of training in how to then talk to the relatives or 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 how to talk to anybody about it it was watch what the seniors are doing absorb what they're doing and emulate it but of course that night when the ICU called me and said he's arrested and we can't resuscitate him you better come so I then have to write a death certificate, but more importantly, te make a telephone call to the relatives, uh, which were his parents, of course. Um, and I think you've got your white coat on and you it's a piece of theatre. And it's not that it doesn't hit you pretty hard and you feel pretty sick and pretty frightened, but you know you've got to be calm and put one foot after another and, and cope with it. And I, I don't really recall it much more, except that I was nervous and, and I had to make the best of it and appear to be professional and mature, even though I wasn't much more than a schoolboy, really. <laughs> but the next story tells you more. So one night at nine o'clock, when I was the surgical houseman on call for the hospital, nine o'clock, we would go to the doctor's sitting room and have sandwiches and coffee, and you had to be first there or the others would eat all the sandwiches. The nine o'clock news goes on. It was not news at nine then, not news at 10 as we have today. And there was a news flash and they said, we interrupt the commencement of the news to say that Princess Anne has been attacked by an assailant on the Mall, and her bodyguard has been shot. He's been taken to Westminster Hospital. And, I, and that minute my bleep started going and I thought, oh dear, that's me. So I felt even more nervous than I had in the previous story. Down I went. And in came two injured people, the policeman who had flung himself across Princess Anne and been shot in the abdomen and in the hand and um, the driver. And the, we exported the driver straight away to St George's, which was a hospital at Hyde Park Corner where the Lanesborough Hotel now is. And thank heavens that my boss, Professor Ellis, arrived having driven from Hampstead at warp speeds hospital surrounded by police because initially it was thought to be an IRA assailant um, and we then had to deal with um, this unfortunate policeman the bodyguard who, who was pretty seriously injured and taken to theatre and again my job was very peripheral I was the boy there helping but again a, a pretty um, pretty much a as, as I said, a baptism of fire. And it brought me into alignment with my own father, who, when he was a student at the same hospital in 1940, was, was down to Dunkirk receiving injured soldiers um, with the evacuation. Although he and I never discussed it, to my great sorrow, we never talked about that parallel in our careers because we had the injured bombing people at times. We had that shooting. Um, but those were my first um, brushes with terribly serious events from which you learn that your role is to always promote a sense of calm and that you're in charge and that all will be well. Yeah, when, when, we, when we met, you were telling me about your experience in, in, the, in hospice, um, which I think people would find really interesting given that at the moment, um, hospices are places that people uh, tend to move to when there's an expectation that their life's gonna end fairly soon. and. Um, Am I right that it was linked to a convent or have I misremembered that? Yes, this was the next stage. So I was two or three years as a junior hospital doctor working through various posts. And eventually I became a general practitioner by the late 70s. We're talking about 1979 now. And I, one of my jobs was that I was GP to the staff at a Catholic hospital in St John's Wood, which was non-denominational in terms of the patients that they take in. This is the hospital of St John and St Elizabeth. But under the auspices of the Order of Mercy, an order of 
Catholic Order of Nuns. And I became their GP, 38 of them at the time, living in the convent on the, on the site, Brampton House. The matron was called Sister Miletus. And, and I got to know them all very well. And they were all pretty senior because during my time taking care of them, one by one, they all died. And, um, and I was always looking after them through that and had that experience of caring for these, these really very honorable and noble women. And the hospital was looking for a, a sort of raison d'etre at the time. It was a private hospital, uh, which had escaped the nationalization of hospitals when the NHS was formed in 1948. And, um, the, the hospital needed to know that it was doing something useful and had a role and wasn't just being a private clinic. And the decision was made that a hospice should be opened. And because I'd taken care of the nuns as they died, and because in my other areas of my practice, I'd looked after ill people right through to the end of their lives and had taken a particular interest in it, not least um, the Jesuits, an, a, a Catholic order of priests based in Farm Street Church which I'd been invited to care for. And I was beginning to get a reputation as a man that was interested in the clergy, as you realise. Um, and I was also by then appointed as GP to the, the choir school at Westminster Cathedral and the new cardinal, who was then Cardinal Basil Hume. So plenty of elderly priests who had mortal illnesses and others to care for. But in that light, we opened a hospice at St. John and St. Elizabeth and I was the first medical director, five beds. I went away to St. Columbus Hospice in Edinburgh to train and had some training under um, a Dr. Hanratty at St. Joseph's Hospice in Hackney. But really what I was doing was general practice, end of life care. And um, I was learning the job on the job, I suppose. And in a way creating the job in that one feature I insisted upon was that we didn't only accept patients who had cancer. And where I differed from Cicely Saunders of St. Christopher's Hospice in South London, was that you could come into our hospice if you were dying of something other than cancer. Uh, because it seemed to me that those people got left out. And we had, for example, a patient who had locked in syndrome, which is a neurological condition where she had had bilateral strokes and could not communicate in any way. I suppose she was in what these days might be called the persistent vegetative state. But she stayed with us for seven years. Her husband visited every day. And it was still a valid and worthy um, role for our hospice, even though many would be critical of me that it was not hospice care in the way that we now know it. But um, in, in, as, as a end of life care, did you get questions from patients that you were looking after about their options? I mean, we, we hear about, um, some people say that palliative care is the answer to all issues when people are suffering at the end of life. But I wonder if you got, you must have got some difficult questions from people about possibly why you were extending their lives. I don't know. Inevitably. And um, a, a good example would be with the patient I've just mentioned. If she developed um, uh, an aspiration pneumonia, which was not at all uncommon as, as a form of demise in people in that situation, the best thing many would argue would be to allow her to die and not treat her. You know, pneumonia is referred to as the old man's friend. But there were others who at the time said, no, no, we must give her physiotherapy. We must tilt and tap. She should have antibiotics. There would be a debate, which would involve also her husband, about whether she should be treated because there was always the hope that she might recover. I, I might have felt at the time hope in vain. But the one thing that you never do is you never destroy hope. And the other thing that you never do that I learned at that time is you never make any predictions about how long anyone will live. Aha. Uh -huh. And when anyone very, very said, relevant. <laughs> yeah. So when people say, oh, well, I was told that I only had six months to live or three weeks to live, nobody ever knows. And it's very dangerous to ever try and put a figure on it. At least that's my view. And that's always been the teaching. Yeah, sure. Um, in the interests of timing and allowing plenty of time for questions, I wonder if we could move to talk about Doc Martin, because when we met, you said that um, you're working on the 10th series 
and indeed I think you're active on that this evening. I mean that that obviously speaks for itself as to um, its success but I just wonder how if you could tell everyone how on earth you came to be involved in the first place was that kind of um, equivalent of a beauty parade where you had to uh, you know, <laughs> sell yourself to get the role? Well no what happened was that Dominic Mingella uh, the brother of Anthony Mingella, who made a film called Truly Madly Deeply that many will remember. So Dominic um, is a very clever uh, writer, younger brother of Anthony. Uh, he came to me, uh, I, I can't remember what the contact was, but um, he said to me, um, I've got this opportunity to write this series and I know nothing at all about general practice. What, what can I do? How can you help me? So we took a, a, an exercise book and a viro and we, we took ourselves off to Cafe Rouge in Kensington Park Road and we sat down and I told him six funny stories. And each one became the A story for each episode of the first series. So, um, and they were all things that had happened to me. And that was how it started. And then Buffalo Pictures who make the TV series under contract to ITV, they're commissioned by ITV to, to make the series, um, clearly, thought that I was okay and that I probably had a fund of stories and asked me to stay on. So Dominic gave way to other writers. We now have four writers. And at the beginning of a new series, we sit down around a big table somewhere and I turn up with a piece of paper on which I'll write 30 possible things that might be worth doing. And there are unwritten rules. No one's ever said to me, this is how it's got to be. But for example, um, there must always be a procedure some little technical thing Doc Martin can do. There must always be a misdiagnosis that he can then get right rather cleverly. Um, and uh, we've, we've developed it on, but it's got more difficult because at the beginning I picked all the low hanging fruit. I did all the easy things and now it's getting a lot more difficult to find things to write about. But if you, if you pop onto the um, London Air Ambulance website, You'll see my son Cosmo, who's an anaesthetist who works on the helicopter as well as at St Mary's. And he, uh, he's going out to Waterloo Station to, um, to see somebody who's had a catastrophic injury and then a cardiac arrest. So I'll steal a story like that. And in series 10, in one episode, I thought we might just subvert that into something that's happening in Doc Martin. But um, I'm, at the moment, I'm having some trouble persuading persuading my team that that's the, the one we're going to do. So there's always a debate about how we use stories that I come up with, but they all have to be real. They have to have happened. And, and that's the way we play it. Yeah. <laughs> well, everyone will have to watch series 10 to see if that bears fruit. But um, I'm sure everyone will be interested to know what it's like um, working with Martin Clunes and whether, I mean, you talked about every, every episode has to have a procedure or something. <laughs> so I don't know whether you have to go and uh, tutor him in, you know, how to make it look terribly professional or it's, it's something exactly like that. exactly what I do. He's, he's the funniest man I've ever met. And he's probably one of the nicest people too. But it, I'll give you an example. We, we had a scene in, um, in what was called the radio station. So if someone's doing a radio program and they've invited a girl in who plays the guitar who's going to sing. And she's a bit hoarse that day and got a sore throat. And so um, she starts, and then she starts gasping. And she's got a thing called acute epiglottitis. So Doc Martin has to rescue her airway. She falls onto the floor, she collapses. They like a collapse, you know. Um, and he has to do a tracheotomy, you know, cut her throat, get a little tube in. So I had to contact um, a, a very good friend of mine who's an ear, nose and throat surgeon at St Mary's and say, can you just give me a quick tutorial on tracheas and how we do it? So <laughs> we did that. And then, um, uh, and then I, I take Martin through it and, and, sh and show him all the actions and we rehearse it together. Um, in a similar way, before any particular piece of filming, I'll always do a little set of rehearsals about phrases because he might not find it easy to say, um, for example, the giant fish tapeworm is called Diaphylobothrium latum, but you need to learn how to say that. It's, or, or, or pulmonary embolism, that's hard enough to say if you're not used to saying, saying it. So I, I record them on my phone and send them to him and then he can practice them you see and then I test him out and we we have a laugh a minute but when we were filming this radio station tracky thing it was pouring with rain and we had to stand outside where they rearranged the lights and a coach turned up 
full of American ladies on a Doc Martin tour. And it was belting with rain. And he said, oh, I must go and talk to those poor women. So he goes over there in the rain and the cold, sign the autographs in a good natured way. I mean, he is the absolute opposite of the man you see on the screen. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure not. Well, <laughs> uh, um, maybe we could turn to your support for the assisted dying campaign. It's been quite a momentous week. Um, and uh, members and supporters of ours who are watching now will be aware of um, all of the activity with the British Medical Association uh, deciding to go neutral uh, or remove its opposition to assisted dying. Um, we also just heard in the last few hours that the Justice Secretary, Robert Buckland, has been moved aside for Dominic Raab. Um, and I was saying to Martin earlier that that really um, shifts the potential path to a public inquiry, but that remains to be seen. But maybe you could just explain, Martin, how you came to be interested in and a supporter of, of the Assisted Dying campaign. There are several components to it. The, the beginning goes back to my time as a hospice doctor, which I did in tandem with my general practice and knowing that there were patients in whom there is often a struggle to control their symptoms, sometimes more than a struggle. Sometimes you feel you're not giving them any service at all in terms of relief, however hard you work on the different facets of it, but I won't labor that. So that's one thing. Secondly, one of my patients, an American living in London, a film director, feared getting prostate cancer. He'd seen his father die of it, probably very, very badly cared for. He feared getting it. He himself did get it. And he got a very aggressive form. He was very, very difficult to treat. He didn't respond well. But, and he, he lived part between London and the south of France. And the end of the story is, and this is really the biggest push for me in this direction, was that he decided to go to Dignitas. And to do that, he needed me to confirm with Dignitas his diagnosis and provide a lot of medical detail, the histology, the treatment he'd received, and so on and so forth, which I did. And he telephoned me when he was on the train on the way there. And we talked for about half an hour, a poignant event in my life as he bravely, uh, but with relief, went in that direction. And subsequently I was on a course at Imperial College in medical ethics with my wife, who's a dietitian, and one of my sons who was studying philosophy at York at the time. And we were asked to reflect about some of our experiences that may have been of relevance. And I told this story and I was attacked by a group of people on the course about how what I had done was illegal and I shouldn't talk about it and that um, I, I could be charged for having facilitated him going to Dignitas. I, well, I reject that because my duty was to accede to his need for the data to be made available. And that was what I did. But um, that was a particular milestone. And it's followed by meeting the book that you re-edited with Jocelyn Catty, Words in Pain. Because Jocelyn was at school with Tanya Haynes and Tanya runs and started with her mother Jane Haynes a psychotherapy practice called the Blue Door Practice and I'm a physician involved with the psychotherapists at the Blue Door Practice as a sort of information service and supporter along with a psychiatrist called Jamie Arkell. So Jane Haynes and I eventually published a book which is called Doctors Dissected about what goes on in our minds when we're endeavouring to be decent ethical medical practitioners. Um, but Tanya runs the Blue Door and she is my great resource for finding psychotherapists of all sorts of shapes, sizes and colours. And um, I'm not sure if she introduced me to Jocelyn, but in any way I discovered Jocelyn and Words in Pain and yourself and read the book and then, of course, willingly came across because I realised that joining this organization was the right way forward because I'm most interested in the possibility of people who are in an intolerable situation rather than what we might, and maybe those listening tonight know as the Oregon model, in other words, the, the six month horizon, we could call it. Yes. And so here I am really, um, yeah. very anxious to be on board. 
well that that's that's wonderful and um, um you, you pick up there on the on the the Oregon model as, so that the assisted dying law that allows those who've been diagnosed with six months or fewer to live but as you've said already this evening and I'm sure many of us know from our own personal experience that um, prognosis can be given which is just not borne out in either direction um, opponents often talk about uh, a slippery slope which is actually a metaphor that annoys me because <clears throat> as far as we at my death my decision are concerned we have a very clear position which is we seek an assisted dying law that extends to the term ill without any arbitrary life expectancy criterion but also as you rightly say to the uh, incurably suffering um, but what what what's your how do you react if someone says oh well if you get a if you get a six month law then you'll be going further I mean we're, we're, we're trying to get a law that goes wider than that in the first place rather than it being a slippery slope but what's your view on that? I think um, the great advantage that we have is that the Oregon law stretches back if I'm right 20 years or getting on that way so we have the advantage of some hard data. And both in terms of whether um, vulnerable people will be exploited and also in terms of whether, um, let's steer clear of the, the dreadful slippery slope look, phrase because that even landed up in the Times today, I think in the editorial. Um, uh, will, will there be, um, a gradual expansion in an undesirable direction so that people um, decide to nudge granny off to heaven um, in order to inherit her house. And we now know, at least from the research done in Oregon, that uh, that doesn't happen. And uh, although it's a very different society from ours, we can draw quite a lot from it. Um, and in fact, so when anyone raises that, I always make the point that it, it's, it's well known that a lot of people have the opportunity and have the prescription and have the medication, but, but don't utilise it. So it's not automatic uh, that once the papers are signed and the legals are dealt with. Um, and actually what you're doing is giving people some control over the most difficult time of their life. And here we are in a world where everyone's expected, given diversity and everything else, to share in decisions. I mean, it's not uncommon for someone like you or I to go along with a bad knee that might need knee replacement or not. And for the orthopedic surgeon, we'll say, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go ahead? But yet, when it comes to the end of life, you have no choices at all. You, you can only just take what comes yeah. and hope. Yeah. For symptom control. The, the, the other um, regular point raised by opponents is about um, a vulnerable people feeling coerced and um, we've heard um, in a previous MDMD event from a Canadian assisted death practitioner Dr Stephanie Green but um, I wonder if you could tell people from a medical perspective how you assess not, not just the mental competence side, but sensing whether there's any element of coercion, because there are, there are decisions that are made where I imagine you've come across situations where you think, well, maybe the family members are pushing them in that direction rather than it being their own decision. How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I think, I think it's, it's, it's a very great skill. And I was thinking you might ask me that question today and I don't have a clear answer. And one of my worries is how in general practice we've lost continuity of care. Because when as a family doctor, you knew a family and sometimes you knew people for years and years and years. And indeed, I delivered a baby and, and, and later in life delivered that baby's baby, a bit of home obstetrics. But, um, you know, it, it was the greatest thing about my job was the continuity element. And that is enormously powerful when it comes to making the sort of decision that you're referring to. But if you meet somebody for the first time, so when I was a hospice consultant, you were, you were meeting those patients for the first time. 
And if you were trying to make a decision now about um, any form of assistance, and you're only meeting for the first time, uh, apart from having a lot of time to spend with people, you can only use your senses based on your experience. There's not a lot more than that, yeah. uh, but it needs a lot of time and probably times one of the most precious commodities in, in any sort of medical care these days. Yeah. Set that to one side. You have to make the time to meet with people and get to know them. And that's what taking a history is all about. And it can only ever be face to face. Yeah, and I guess that's why in the jurisdictions that have assisted dying laws, there's, there's this requirement for two medical assessments, but not only that, they then have to take place for a second time after a time interval, so that there's more chance for the practitioners to make an assessment. As you say, just meeting a person for the one time and then having to make a decision uh, might, might not give you enough of a, uh, bearing in mind people's frame of mind can vary from day to day, but if you meet them after an interval for a second time, um, the, uh, assessing whether they'd been coerced by family members to come along rather than doing it of their own free will, I imagine would then uh, be more straightforward. Yes, I think the other difficulty is it's a bit like family therapy. You will sometimes find a wife who's desperate for her husband to be released from his pain, his suffering, his symptoms, but he's got an elderly mother who says there must be something you can do and when, when are you going to start some treatment? Uh, you know, that there will be conflict within the family. Yeah. And you have to talk to everybody, all, well, what, what's the word they use these days? All stakeholders, you know, another ghastly phrase. You know, everybody who might be involved. You, it's not just, oh, um, you're the, you're the next of kin, I'll talk to you. It's mm. much more than that when it comes to this sort of decision making. Yeah. Um, in the interest of time and moving on to some questions in a few moments, I just thought the last question I'd ask you is what your reaction is to the British Medical Association um, change in stance. So uh, uh, removing its opposition to assisted dying. I should let everyone know that Martin was one of the many signatories to the letter that was published in the Guardian and was the subject of a, a big article yesterday um, and uh, who knows I mean everything in a campaign is nudging here and there and um, let, 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 let's hope that that letter was one of the things that nudged it albeit to a very close vote but what's your reaction Martin to, to the change of position? Well I'm very pleased you know, the Royal College of Physicians had previously uh, circulated all members and fellows and had adopted a neutral stance. In other words, not to oppose a change in the law. And for the BMA not to follow suit would feel very uncomfortable. Now, the BMA is made up of lots of parties, although primarily it's a sort of GP organisation. But all doctors can belong and, I, and it's our trades union. And I think about, I think more than 50% of doctors do belong, but it's not universal. Not everyone belongs to the BMA who doesn't choose to. No. Nevertheless, the fact that they are now prepared to adopt a neutral position is highly you know, acceptable and ideal. And it would have been very uncomfortable if they hadn't. The Royal College of GPs did a survey, but there was a very small number of the members and fellows that responded. And I don't think it was well conducted, dare I say, publicly. Um, I, I'm not sure where the GPs would lie if they repeated that survey now. But I suspect that the Royal College of GPs would, would be new, now neutral in this era. That's interesting because I, 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 I looked into that only in the last couple of days. And I think it was 13% of their membership actually voted yeah. or, or responded to the survey. Uh, which suggests that perhaps they didn't engage as well as they might. I know, I know obviously surveys are never going to get, um, the, you know, the high 80s or something responding, but 13 sounds pretty feeble on something which is, let's face it, pretty impactful on, on people's lives. I would just like to thank everyone, by the way, because I know lots of our members and supporters did write to medical professionals um, to try and uh, encourage them to sign up to our letter. And... Um, you know, 
Kieran, who's behind the screen there, but might shortly become visible in relation to questions, um, spent a huge amount of time getting that story through to The Guardian. And it's really been the catalyst for a lot of wider publicity, including um, Kieran and I have both been talking with radio stations. And uh, uh, tomorrow I'm talking on BBC Jersey because the Jersey Citizens Jury uh, full results are coming out. So when we when we ask you wonderful members and supporters to do things, uh, you know, our calls to action as we name them, um, it's amazing what small gestures by one individual can do. You know, it's almost like the sum is greater than, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So thanks very much to everyone um, who, who, who contributed to that exercise. Um, Kieran, I don't know whether you want to unmask yourself or not, but um, do you want to, uh, do you want to, I know we had some pre-submitted questions and then I also have noticed the top of my screen little flashes coming up that people have been posting in the chat or the um, question and answers. So do, do you want to lead on with that? Uh, yes, Trevor, thanks for uh, inviting me to do so. We've had a series of questions in the chat and we're going to try and get to as many of them as possible, but also some of the questions that people pre-submitted in advance. And we're going to try and bring as many people up to ask the question directly as possible. Please be aware there will be a short delay while people are transitioning. But our first question in that regard um, comes from Alex Pondolfo. Uh, thank you. Um, my question uh, to Martin is, what do you think Dr Martin Ellingham would make of assisted dying? I'm going to um, paraphrase something my boss Harold Ellis from 1973 used to say, which he always used to say to people, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> and the reason is that I actually interviewed Dr. Martin Ellingham yesterday because I hoped someone would ask me this. And um, the truth of it is that Dr. Ellingham, who's very precise and likes everything tidy and doesn't like anything emotional, would say, very good. I think we must just get on with it. I'm going to write the prescription now. And you have to see a colleague of mine. And um, we will be meeting again for another discussion in two weeks. But I'm very supportive. And I think he would just go straight for it. Uh, and, and at least that was the conclusion that, uh, that came forward yesterday. And I hope you find it interesting. I'm not sure we'll ever cover it, I have to say, <laughs> in our next series. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, our next question comes from Claire, who's asked me to read it out for her. She's asked, what are your views on allowing patients the choice to die at home instead of in the hospital? I feel very strongly about that. There's only one place, and that would be if circumstances permit, and hopefully they, they can be made to do so, should always be at home in your own bed, fully supported by whatever... Um, systems are, uh, are necessary to do that. H hospital, in my view, is not a place to die. I hope that helps and I hope, I hope others would agree. Thanks. Uh, and our next question was also pre-submitted. It comes from Bridget and it, it says, I I've worked in the NHS for over 35 years. And I've worked in hospice for a while and I know that patients were assisted to die. I'm puzzled by the lack of honesty about this. What do you think is the best way that we can convince people that assisted dying is not about um, denying people a choice, it's about making sure that they have a pleasant and pain-free way of ending their life? That's a huge question and an important observation um, because it, it cuts to the absolute core of what palliative care is about and I think there's too little provision of palliative care and there's too little known about it and of course my palliative care experience which was through the 1980s was long before the whole service became as mature and well informed and well staffed as it is now but it is still um to our great shame that it's not part of the NHS it's nearly all charitable and I understand that as many as 6,000 people die every year for want of palliative care, lack of resources. Now I've sidestepped your question a bit. Um, 
because the problem is lack of information, lack of knowledge, lack of awareness. And for many patients to think that sedation terminally is the same thing as assisted dying. Um, and indeed, patients have said to me, um, oh, the doctor just came along when my father died and just gave an injection and, and can't you do the same for my mother? And you know, you're quite taken aback when you're faced with that um, because you're on your back foot with trying to explain what may have happened in a circumstance where you were not involved and try to explain why you're not going to take the same mood now, maybe 10 years after the person's father died and his mother is now terminally ill. So I think we need better education and better understanding as a widespread part of our society and, and not enough is known. There are plenty of people out there who believe hospices are assisted dying places they, and they don't necessarily know what hospice care is all about. So I, I'm aware I probably haven't answered your question as, as well as one might, but it's, it's to do with better understanding and better explanation and better teaching. And I don't quite know how we will get there, given that now people have so little time with their doctors, if they get any time at all, I'm afraid. Uh, th thanks, Martin. And our next questioner comes from Barbara. So sorry, <laughs> I was <laughs> muted. You can hear me now? I can see you as well. Thank you. Marvellous. Hello, Martin, thank you so much. Uh, really, really uh, interesting to hear about your life. My sister was a palliative care a leader, a medical leader. And so I understand a lot of the problems from a medic's point of view, but as the relative of a patient and as a potential patient myself, one of the things I find really hard to take is the idea that whatever a doctor must do, they mustn't destroy hope because there must be a high proportion of cases in which it is very clear that death much sooner than later is inevitable. And I'm also a humanist celebrant. And I had a case as a celebrant in which somebody had refused to accept that their death was inevitable. And as a consequence, left their family in total chaos because they had failed to make any preparation whatsoever for their death. I also had situations as a friend and as a member of the family where saying goodbye was rendered impossible because the patient was not prepared to accept that a death very soon was what was going to happen. So I'm asking you to respond to that. Well, those situations are not that uncommon. Denial. Um, I'm not quite sure how that mixes in with hope, really. Um, and you heard me say at the beginning, you must never destroy hope. But, um, but, but, but which sort of hope are we talking about? Given the fact that somebody's inevitably going to die quite soon, yes. then what sort of hope might you be offering? Well, I, I suppose it's hope, really, that, that you're not going to suffer. We are going to do something about your symptoms. Right. You know, it's, it's never hope that this, that, you know, the Archangel Gabriel is going to send a thunderbolt and, you know, you'll get better. Yes. Um, but even as my own father died, um, um, my mother, still alive, age 92, not watching tonight, but she um, endlessly said, when your father's better, we will we'll go to Jute and Glen for a weekend's holiday. Mm -hmm. And a lot... It was difficult for myself and my brother, who's an anaesthetist, to, to be trying to be doctors as well. But there were no doctors in evidence in our, in our life up in North London, I'm sorry to say. But um, to try and get some realism into the process of a, a dying 90-year-old man. Um, and, and that's the thing. It's all, it, it's about, and that's what palliative care is about. It must be about nurturing people as you will know through your sister, into acceptance and an understanding. And should we call it the retreat from denial? But hey, you more often fail than you succeed, let me say. 
So you're not suggesting that that this don't destroy hope is about don't don't disguise from the patient that they are die. No. Disguise. I I had a close friend whose doctor constantly said to him, "Well, you know, you never know, you never know, you never know," and so he went into quite serious shock when it became clear that he would be dying within days rather than months or years. Well, you see, that's a deviation from the, the whole thing of you can't ever tell how long someone will survive for. And you and I know all the people who hold on and hold on and hold on because a granddaughter is about to have a baby or because a great granddaughter is about to get married. You know, you can almost see that. And it just shows the power of the mind over your immunology and of emotion over the way your physiology works. And we've all seen that, those of us in this type of work. Um, uh, and I suppose if you hold out any hope, it will be that maybe you will see the snowdrops and, and maybe you will be here when the baby's born. And, and, but it gives you the opportunity to get away from the denial. Thanks, Barbara. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna move on to another question we've got. So Martin, this is from Christina and she asks, do you think that having religious representation in the House of Lords has had an influence on the issue? And this perhaps is particularly relevant because, of course, Baroness Meacher's bill on assisted dying is due to be debated later uh, next month. I'm not sure which direction their influence goes. And it's worth drawing your attention to this week's British Medical Journal, in which... George Carey, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, has changed his views on assisted dying through contact with those going through end of year crises. So he's now come round to saying that there's no sin in an assisted death. And a rabbi, the broadcaster Jonathan Romain of the Maidenhead Synagogue, has taken the same position. He's actually vice chair of Dignity and Dying. So I'm not sure if a rabbi like him is in the House of Lords, certainly George Carey would be. Um, and they're bound to have had some influence, but it looks to me as if people of a religious commitment are moving in their position on this. And that is to be hoped for. Um, I hope I'm coming some way to answering your question there. Thanks, Martin. And our next question should be coming from Phil. Are you going to appear, Phil? Oh, apologies, everyone. I think this is an example of this short delay that I mentioned earlier. And just giving time for Phil to move on, um, I'll ask perhaps the next question, which was pre-submitted, which was submitted by Angie, and Angie wanted to know, what do you make of claims that there should be a citizens assembly on assisted dying? Might this be a pathway to reform or a way of kicking the issue into the long grass? Well, I think the latter, um, in that we know that the public uh, opinion on this has shifted rapidly in the direction of favour. Um, and I'm not sure that a citizen's assembly would bring anything else uh, to the party. It has nothing more to offer. We, we know what most people feel about this. And the battle is to get parliament to change the law. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what others say on that subject. Could I, could I just interject there, Martin? I was wondering yes. that. I was wondering what you thought. Everyone says there's no votes in assisted dying. And it struck me that um, a citizen's jury, such as they've had in Jersey, for example, would be the um, perfect answer for politicians. They could say, we're doing what the people wanted. It's not, you know, it, it sort of divorces them from being the primary movers. I just wondered whether they might, they might find that having a citizen's assembly would actually facilitate them in talking to their constituents. Well, that's a good thought, because what you're saying is that it's a more potent stimulus than, uh, than a decent survey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bigger lever to use on the politicians, yeah. as well as giving them an excuse for not taking 
the blame from their other constituents. <laughs> anyway, let's. We've got two people here waiting to ask a question, so I'll back out. That's it. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Our next question should be coming from Claire. Hello, Martin. Um, obviously, it's great that um, medical opinion is shifting in favour of assisted dying. Why do you think this is? I think that's a very good question. I think it's greater awareness, possibly, because as the hospice movement and palliative care has matured, most medical students have had experience of it now. And so those people are coming through and becoming junior hospital or senior hospital doctors now and, and um, general practitioners. And so the culture within medicine has changed as uh, numbers of old school entrenched, rather more conservative doctors have disappeared off the, uh, off the scene. So I think that's probably the case. It's been the maturation of the palliative care um, movement. You know, the, the unit that I founded at St. John's very quickly formed a close liaison with University College Hospital. And we had medical students coming. And um, yet when I was a medical student, we'd never heard of hospice care. It didn't mean anything to us. There was no teaching in the area of palliative care. So I, I think that's the answer to your question, that it's an emerging um, culture of doctors who've had experience of palliative care and better understanding about care of the dying. Thanks, Martin. And uh, Phil is back with us. So our next question comes from Phil. Uh, yeah, um, I uh, experienced uh, helping my mother and my aunt uh, towards their end of life, and they both suffered from dementia. Um, now, according to the Office of National Statistics, dementia is the leading cause of death in England and Wales. As a GP and an assisted dying supporter, I wondered what your views were on assisted dying for dementia sufferers. And if it's permitted, should it be limited to those in the early stages of dementia while they still retain mental capacity at the time of death, which is the case in Switzerland and Canada? Yes, this is dangerous territory. Um, and we have discussed it considerably because to make a rational informed decision, you have to be as in possession of your mental faculties as possible. And um, if you then were to sign an advanced directive and say, look, this is what I would like to happen, and you then subside into dementia, and the, the emergence of dementia can be gradual, or it can be stepwise, or sometimes it can be quite dramatic, not quite overnight, but nearly. Um, if that's the case, I don't think that it's ethical to then... Um, follow up on that advanced directive and allow that person um, an assisted death because they're not then in a position to, to revise or review a decision they made which may have been months and more likely years earlier. So I think assisted dying for those in a state of dementia is a non-starter or pretty close to being a non-starter and um, and if it ever came to pass in other societies, it, that, that would be when vulnerable people would be taken advantage of. Um, but, but, but if I can just come back on that, um, um, what about the case, you know, is, is, if it's a gradual dementia, so Alzheimer's example, which I understand is a little, little more predictable than some, um, in the early stages, um, you still have mental capacity. And in Switzerland, they make a, um, a very, very big issue of this, that, uh, that you, you can have an assisted death in Switzerland if you have mental capacity, even though you have early stage dementia. Uh, do, you, do you not think that is a sufficiently safe approach? I think it's skating on pretty thin ice, Phil, really. Um, and I, I accept it may be possible to make some judgments. Um, you know, I think I, at the age of 71, have got mild cognitive impairment. I sometimes can't remember quite where I, what I had for lunch yesterday. Um, so all of us get some cognitive impairment 
as we age. And the question is, when does that attain the status of a diagnosis? Um, and, and, and when have you reached a point when you can no longer make a, a rational decision when you're in a good frame of mind? And I'm reminded of a section in the book by Camilla Cavendish about how to live longer, um, where a nun aged 90 who was functioning beautifully in many facets of her intellect and so on, at death was found to have really severe Alzheimer's disease by token of the pathology of her brain. But yet she had previously been functioning well. So you're right in that there's not necessarily a good correlation between pathophysiological events in the brain and your function and your ability to make decisions. Um, and as we all know, many people are much better in their own environment and they're not at all good if you, good if you whisk them off you know, to Madeira for a holiday, they then get lost on the first morning. So I, I think we must be very wary, is my view, and, and probably resist assisted dying in those with dementia, is my view. Thanks, Martin. And there was a, a, uh, there was a point, and that's perhaps worth just coming to, that was in the chat. And that was by Miriam about why wider medical attitudes are changing. She said that medical students are a much broader cross section of society than they used to be from all backgrounds, unlike 50 years ago. Therefore, medical students represent society. Society wants change, and medical students are part of society. Just I, think, I think that's beautifully put. So, congratulations, much better than I could have stated it. <laughs> Uh, there, there you go, Miriam. Uh, just moving on to some other of our pre-submitted questions. Uh, there are quite a few around the same theme. And forgive me, Liz, I'm just going to briefly put your question. But in brief, Liz was asking, the campaign that Dignity in Dying advances seems not to advance to those who would have incurable and non-life-threatening conditions. Earlier this year, we heard from Diane Monday that if such a law was passed, it might be more difficult in the future to pass a further law which extended to those who wouldn't be covered by a law with a six month limit. What do you make of that? And what do you think is the best way we could convince politicians to go for that more inclusive law the first time round? Well, I think we now have an opportunity, particularly with the publicity given by the, the, the BMA debate this week, to open up the debate further and to continue it um, because as you say the dignity in dying position doesn't allow somebody who's tetraplegic like possibly the Tony Nicholson case would be the best example but there are others um, whose life is intolerable who wish for an assisted death um, and I think I think the answer lies with continuing the debate and continuing to do our best to educate our members of parliament and, and all possible contacts who have any influence within the law. Um, but if the dignity in dying position came forward and the law was changed to allow for that, it is then going to be a long and uphill battle to get it extended, I accept that. Thanks, Martin. And our next question should be coming from Stephen, who I think is joining us shortly. You're on mute, Stephen. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I've got you. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is. Um, uh, I suppose a question about ethics rather than a question about what we should necessarily be campaigning for right now. Although I was also going to make a point that I don't think there's any such thing as a slippery slope because actually democracy, an essential part of democracy is that you can change laws as you go along. Um, but the ethical question is, um, I'm, I'm an ex-pediatric nurse and um, at the moment, everybody seems to think that 18 should be the minimum age at which you can apply for um, an assisted death. And 
I'm personally not so sure about that. And I think it should at least be open to discussion as to whether some children are perfectly capable of taking decisions at a younger age. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. I think you're right, Stephen. Um, and I had practical experience of that with a boy of 16 who had a, what's called a craniopharyngioma. Yes, I know that. Which, which you will know about. Um, so this is a non-cancerous brain tumour, but it was destroying his brain. And he was very, very ill. He couldn't walk. He had no, very few functions. And it was tragic. And, and he, you know, and he was an intelligent, articulate guy. And as well as he could, he was able to say, how long has this got to go on? You know, and at 16, he knew and he understood. So you're right. You've, you, and you've had the experience as a paediatric nurse, possibly of seeing children in this sort of position. Um, because although in law he was a child, you know, physiologically and anatomically and so on, he was a, he was a young man, but he also had the intellect to, to cope and understand with what was happening to him. And so, you know, you can only make a judgment on, on each individual and, and here we will be uh, with, with a watershed etched in stone at the age of 18. So that's my view. I think it needs to be more flexible than that and it probably will be. Uh, there's a couple more questions, I think, with the time we have remaining. But I'm conscious that you wanted to say to me earlier, Trevor. So maybe if you want to pick up from that point. No, I, I was only uh, just going to make a comment about dementia um, because I saw something in the chat as well, which is why I keep looking up to clicking on. I've got a touch screen. So, um, first of all, as our members and supporters would know, we look to the Canada model and um, the assisted death practitioners that we talk to over there. I mean, the dementia cases aren't ruled out over there, but the, um, the practitioners are absolutely clear that they want to hear from the person, both at the time of assessment and of administration uh, of medication, that you know, they're, they're fully satisfied, they understand what is being done. There was someone in the chat said, what's the point of an advanced decision if it's not followed through when I lose mental capacity? Well, generally speaking, an advanced decision about your general health and welfare and do not resuscitate and so on has to be respected. The issue here is whether an advanced decision that extends to uh, wanting an assisted death should be uh, complied with, which um, as far as our campaign is concerned, that, that's not as far as we're going. We're, we think that people should be mentally competent at the time of administration as well as at the time of assessment. But that was just a comment. Kieran, any more questions? <laughs> uh, yes, I think we're just going to do two more. Um, I can see that Anna's in attendance, so forgive me, Anna. I'm just going to shorten your question in the interests of time. The question is, how do we communicate the unbearable suffering that is caused by conditions that are incurable to those who object to assisted dying before? Uh, that impinges very much on the earlier question. Um, and I think it's only by those of us in the know being involved enough and having the energy and the time to badger and to remonstrate and to educate um, uh, our lawmakers. We've, we've got to somehow be able to tell those stories um, because too many of those people are not familiar enough with what it is we're talking about. Um, so again, it's all about communication, is it not? And, and not only communication, but effective communication and the opportunity to, to do that. Um, sorry to sidestep another, another <laughs> question, but it's, it's one of the hardest things, is it not? To get through to people. Um, well, I, I know Anne is in attendance, so if she wants to add a follow-up, I'm sure she can in the chat. Uh, the final question, which seems apt given the bill is about to be debated, comes from Carrie, and it asks, if you were able to speak to a peer who will be able to vote and debate in the Baroness Mitra bill debate, what would you say to them? That is a good question, because I've networked and I'm not going to mention the name with a peer 
who is in the House of Lords, who was a patient of mine, and who has been involved in thinking about all of this. And I told him that I was involved in this meeting tonight, and I hoped to discuss it with him. And he actually has not come back to me. He did an email, but he hasn't given me the opportunity for a conversation. And it may be that he's even going to listen to tonight's conversation before he will talk to me. Um, but it was a disappointment that I wasn't able to, to get in touch with him and, and invite him to give me his views and to take part. And my only other contact in the House of Lords is, is one who is now uh, so old in his 90s in a state of mild cognitive impairment that he, he wouldn't be a valid discussion. But uh, that's my position. I'm going to force myself upon my much younger member of the House of Lords, who is himself a, a prominent lawyer, and had that conversation. Well, th thank you very much, Martin, and thanks, thanks overall for your contribution. It's been really interesting hearing, hearing about your very wide background, and I'm sure we're all going to be tuning in to the 10th series of <laughs> Doc Martin, which will be airing in spring next year? Or no, no, we, we start filming in February. Yeah. We're now doing a Christmas special as well at the end of the year. We finish filming in July and it goes out in September. Right, okay. Uh, that's well, the advertising break. Put, put, put that in your diaries for next year. And um, it's interesting that the last question was about the Meacher bill because uh, from our members and supporters' perspective, we, as the um, second reading approaches, which I think is the 22nd of October, we will be contacting you about things you can do to help us. Uh, to try and influence the decision makers in that process. Um, so, so look out for that. Um, I would like to thank all of our members and supporters without whom we really uh, wouldn't have a, a, a raison d'etre because we depend on you um, both from uh, your donations but also you come up with ideas for us which we try to take forward. Um, I don't know uh, from the list of participants whether everyone is already a member or supporter of our organisation but you can go onto our website and it's incredibly straightforward to join us and those of you who already are members there is a donate button if you'd like to make a small donation perhaps or even a large one to thank uh, Dr Mar Martin Skur for coming along this evening to this free event um, and uh, we will be hearing more from Martin because he's now part of our medical group and uh, we've been getting increasing numbers joining that and that's going to become quite uh, an active uh, group I can see with some high profile names there which is really for the benefit of our campaign but um, at the middle of a what's well working back seven days an incredibly busy seven days with the BMA survey and various other things happening. Um, I'd like to thank Kieran for all the hard work he's done uh, and particularly in supporting this evening's event because um, he is the dynamo at the centre of what we do. M most of, uh, well, all of the board are volunteers um, and uh, Kieran really gives up, comes up with such incredible ideas. Um, indeed, it was his idea to start these online events. Just to save the date thing for members, um, we are going to try and have our first physical meeting on the 24th of April 2022. So you might want to put that um, in your diaries. The, the space is booked at Friends Meeting House as we've met before, but um, uh, obviously we're going to be driven by the reality of this life we've been living through for the last year or so. Uh, things may change, but um, hope we'll actually get the chance to meet at, at, at that, uh, which seems a long way away, but it's, it's amazing how quickly time comes through. I don't, I don't know, Martin, if you've got any closing comments you'd like to make before we let you go to your Dr. Um, Martin. Um, I'm um, n nothing important to add except apologies if I've been inadequate with any of those very interesting and worthwhile questions. And thank you for inviting me to come and. Um, at least contribute something, I hope. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you, everyone. We're going to close the meeting at this point. Thanks for joining us.